welcome back everyone uh, welcome back to my setting back to wheel of time this time a crown of swords the first 10 chapters including a very hefty prologue so what happens well in the prologue we have elida uh, she uh, makes a decision to send 50 of the reds of the red ajas led by a sister named Tovain to the Black Tower because the information about Black Tower has leaked and uh, her intention and her instinct as a red is to gentle anyone and everyone there. And uh, she's also under a false impression that there is only a handful of men that can channel there, not an entire regiment of murderous um, just G.I. Joe's Cook and Channel. And uh, she also hears the news about Egwene being raised. And uh, again, if I may add, quite falsely believes that uh, the Aes Sedai that are in Salidar would return to her and uh, will be under her control because, well, Egwene is young and uh, she has recently been just not even a full Aes Sedai, so she underestimates her. Then um, what happens next is quite interesting because she has a foretelling and she has a foretelling in front of someone. So Alviarin is her um, sort of main agent in the tower and um, in front of her as Alviarin is delivering her information about Egwene and everything else, Elida has a foretelling because that's her gift. She, uh, at times, she can foretell um, the outcomes of specific events. So she has a foretelling where she sees that Tower will be whole again, and uh, the Black Tower will fall? Question mark. I'll quote the full foretelling uh, later, later on that. Then we cut back to Alviarin, who is, surprise, surprise, a dark friend, and she is talking to uh, Misana, who is uh, a, um, one of the Forsaken, and uh, apparently can change her appearance because Alviarin, Alviarin uh, suspects that the way that Misana has um, evaded everyone is to take the guise of a sister that has disappeared long time ago. So this Forsaken uh, teaches uh, traveling to Alviari. Uh, next, well, what happens next? Uh, Alviari does a lot of thinking, so she goes through all of the sides on the board, so to say, and uh, she fears that Elida has become too unpredictable, too difficult to control. So she ponders if she needs to kill and replace Elida as she did to others. And um, yeah, so that's that. She now knows how to travel. Back to Pedro Nial, our favorite supervillain. So he is uh, engaging in a game of stones with uh, Queen Morghese and uh, she uh, defeats him, uh, which is something that happens frequently, I, uh, I get the impression. And then she asks him to see his, her son, Galat. And uh, Nial um, doesn't want to do that because he is using her as a leverage uh, for the white cloaks. Then uh, their talk is interrupted by the uh, fake spy master that works for the white cloaks. He brings uh, this uh, message from uh, Taraban and uh, then he just moves in and tries to assassinate Nial, he stabs the man. Well, if he is a man. More on that later. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, uh, Eamon uh, 
dashes into the room and kills the the spy master. I think his name is Omerna. Yeah, Omerna. And uh, then uh, Inquisitor uh, Asunava enters in, Inquisitor of the White Cloaks, and kind of saves Nial's skin, prevents him so that he is finished by another guy. Um, and that's about that as far as Nial goes. What happens next is we cut to <laughs> a scene with a bunch of prudes uh, by the name of Perrin, Ibarra and Aram who are feeling uh, skivish, uncomfortable because a bunch of uh, scantily dressed guys shine and <laughs> that, putting that aside uh, two of them chat and Aram is worrying out loud that uh, the, the captured ace die they think he's, he thinks that uh, they are dangerous and he gives a not so subtle suggestion that it would be better for everyone if they were dead uh, but uh, Perrin gets angry at that implication and forbids him to talk on the subject um, he does overhear similar rumblings around the camp from the Two River people so he just decides to go to Rand and have a chat with him and um, on the way there he has a lot of uh, introspection self-reflection about how many people he sent to die and um, how many maidens died and um, things like that so Q Rand uh, both uh, Tame and uh, sorry Lea um, say the same thing they think that the ACDI should be uh, given over to them. And uh, by that, they both imply that all of ACDI, not even those who were um, guilty of capturing Rand, but everyone. So Rand just tells everyone to shut up because they're squabbling like small children. And um, Rand decides to give the Aesidae to the care of the Wise Ones. And uh, he reasons with Time, who clearly has an appetite for, I don't know, experimenting on Aesidae? <laughs> who knows at this point. But he tells him that Ashaman uh, have uh, much more important things to do. And uh, yeah, so uh, of course, the Aesidae in question um, try to object, but he shushes them swiftly and quickly. And, uh, well, then there is a question of healing him because uh, he is still injured. So he commands Alana to heal him and the rest of the Aesidae go. After they go, uh, Time approaches Rand and says that he should absolutely uh, have a honor guard, an Ashaman honor guard. And Rand already has his soldiers, his dedicated, but again, Time insists that he should have some Ashaman. So uh, Rand just looks around and uh, picks one at random a man uh, called Dashiva and uh, he is quite interestingly uh, almost talked out of it more on that, more on that later so um, Perrin then approaches Rand because he is such a high moral compass and then even though that uh, Perrin doesn't quite trust um, Aesidae, and he has been told, even by Verin, I believe, in the, in the past, not to believe Aesidae, specifically Alana, for example, he says that he is absolutely against the mistreatment of Aesidae that are captured. Uh, 
Um, and uh, something else props up when uh, Rand and uh, Dashiva talk. Um, he, Dashiva, refers to someone as Mihail. Uh, I'm not sure about the pronunciation. It's not Michael or Mihail. Mihail, it's uh, it means leader in the old tongue. And uh, this is a title that Tame has given himself behind um, Rand's back. And um, then Rand asks um, Dashiva to make a gateway, which he does. And they all go to Karen, and uh, they are met there by a wise one named uh, Fer, Fera, Feragin, Feragin. So apparently, um, when they talk to her, rumors have uh, kind of uh, spread through the land that uh, either Rand has uh, taken a knee to the White Tower, or he is no longer who he is, and the bleakness has returned, and la di da. Rand is in Kiernan because he wants to confirm the rumors of someone occupying the throne, uh, even though he specifically told everyone that he intends Elaine to be crowned there. So. Uh, Colavir has been crowned and it is confirmed so he goes there and enters the hall and he sees her there sitting on the throne uh, she welcomes him and tells him that well you see this crown on my head uh, not coming back from that you can't undo it and then Rand does this very, very gangster move of taking her crown, crushing it in his bare fist, and then rebuilding it through thin air. And see, nothing happened. Uh, what can, what was done, can be undone. So, <laughs> and she still insists that. All of this was legal. She is a rightful ruler, ruler la di da. She will rule, of course, of course, in his name, but she is not moving an inch. Um, but Perrin then asks, okay, but did you murder people to get there? And she, of course, denies everything. And, um, well, um, Fail is, uh, has infiltrated uh, the court there as well, so he is also worrying about her there. So she keeps insisting that um, she is insisting that um, she is there by right. She is not moving an inch, and um, well. Faile moves in as one of the witnesses and um, reveals that uh, Colavir has plotted to break her oath of fealty and then the brain uh, charges her with treason and uh, well a punishment for treason is of course death and not just death uh, good old-fashioned hanging because apparently Ren has brought this uh, new um, slash old slash new custom of hanging. So Colavir kind of uh, denies everything until the, her, uh, uh, to the latest, to the, her almost last breath, but she lets it slip that uh, the reason why is she even here and the reason why she is so confident about being there is that she was promised by Aes Sedai that Rand will not return. So Ren does something unexpected. Everyone expects him to just execute her. He banishes her instead. He strips her of her land, of her belongings, everything except the uh, clothes that she wears and uh, just leaves her the tiniest possible farmland she has and orders her to be um, just a feudal uh, peasant <laughs> that is confined to that farm. 
and that's that. And uh, what happens next? Well, Rand then leaves, and uh, Dobrain and Fail uh, have a little chit chat, and uh, right next to Rand, and they kind of imply that it would be better for everyone if Colavir was killed. Now, if there is one common theme <laughs> I'm sensing, is that. A lot of people uh, kind of um, are are lately in the wheel of time operating under mob rules. <laughs> I mean, um, they're not very creative with their euphemisms about oh, wouldn't it be awful if this and that had an accident? But it's been a strangely common theme lately. So they can can they, they talk about um Colavir being a a thorn in everyone's side and a complication and it would be better if she was dead but uh Perrin just speaks up and says no don't do that what's wrong with you so yeah and then he has a shouting match with Fail which I don't know. It, it, uh, when when Perrin speaks up, it kind of I, I have a feeling that it always has the opposite reaction. It it uh, it just I don't know. Emboldens Fail. She likes it. She likes to argue, and she doesn't listen. But whatever. Um, Ren then uh, asks Perrin to lead his army and of course Perrin refuses because blah 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 I'm not the general of course you are and uh, Ren then says well if you're not gonna lead the army I'm sure we can find something for you to do Just, uh, not, uh, I don't know your friends guys come on um, Rand then travels to Endor with a bunch of people and the maidens and uh, they do this whole charade of uh, dressing him up uh, as a prisoner and then they blindfold him and all of the maidens giggle because they lead him by hand and la di da and they take him to uh, Bashir and uh, once they're there Bashir questions them about his intentions what he wants to do um, what to do with White Tower, um, what to do with the rebels that are outside Karen. So all of that um, leads to Rand's decision to march on Ilion, which makes everyone happy because um, Rand does allow for the fifth to be taken, something he um, did uh, was against so far while in the in the wetlands so the the fifth is uh the the fifth part that kind of cust customarily the aiel allow themselves to take when they plunder a land or a city they only take a fifth but they do take a fifth in gold or whatever so uh come back to Egwene. um Egwene, um is uh, thinking long and hard about what who which sister is which um two sisters of every aja except a blue so this part was kind of if i'm being honest a bit um meh so, but more more about that uh, later so uh, siwan voices an opinion that um some of the sitters at the tower might be black aja which is true right um but the night is interrupted by a daring escape by Mogadian because um, since Egwene is the one who holds the the necklace that uh, controls the color of Mogadian, uh, she feels a disconnect, a, a certain uh, feeling of discomfort, pain, sharp pain, and uh, followed by absence of Mogadian. And uh, Mogadian has escaped. Apparently someone who can channel, uh, probably a man, helped her. And she's off. And um, 
then Egwene and, and Siwan and Lien talk about what how it is to be the Emberlin and La Dida. And um, then Egwene has a bunch of headaches, which is something I uh, empathize with. I do have migraines myself quite often. So I feel you, Egwene. <laughs> and um, well, um, Egwene thinks some more. Uh, she thinks about the rebels and the Ace Sedai that um, have gained new talent, something that was lost for the ages. And uh, she then gets an encrypted letter. And uh, the letter is saying that everything is swell, it's uh, everything's good, but. Uh, Elana has bonded Rand and um, but Egwene kind of yeah the way it's worded I don't think Egwene realizes that so it goes something is Alana has formed a an attachment with the wool merchant which might be useful and I don't think she realizes that um, and um, well yeah so it's a message from uh, Nynaeve and 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 the rest of them and yeah um that's that that's as as much as what happens it's a hefty uh hefty chapter but let's go on to questions so first uh first question um i'm not sure if this was mentioned in the past but in the prologue it is stated that the tower was built with the help of the Ogier, which makes sense. It's a it's a marvelous um, building. Um, furthermore, Elida talks about reinforcing uh, the materials like the stone uh, with the power uh, through the earth weaves. Is, is that common practice? Was that common practice? Was it um, just not needed in the past? I realize this is a very trivial, even frivolous question, but it is something that I enjoy thinking about in, in any type of fictional setting. Uh, it seems trivial, but when you think about it is, I mean, what happens to the fortress that is already a building which is built to last when it's reinforced by something like that is it like a stationary tank how do you conquer such a thing um, and so on and so forth um, other question um, is Fayil plotting something um, I know that she has an opinion that um, she knows better than Perrin um, even and this is nothing about her being younger or him being older nothing to do with age i think the she is patronizing him and i'm just curious about is she plotting because she does quite a bit of stuff behind his back well, supposedly for his own good but i don't know i'm feeling weird about her marriage i i'm not too sure if it's going to last it may but who knows i I don't know. Um, other question, um, and this is uh, the, the 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 prophecy that Elida has foretold, and I quote: "The White Tower will be whole again, except for remnants cast out and scorned, whole and stronger than ever. Randall Thor will face the Emerald Seat and know her anger. The Black Tower will be rent in blood and fire." Ed's sister will walk in its grounds. This I foretell. Um, end of quote. Was Elida foretelling, assuming it, it was real, um, the, the events that will transpire for the old tower or the reformed tower, the one led by Egwene? Now, I'm sure she thinks that her side will be the one to be whole again but um, what's old is new again I don't know 
question for the ages or just for this few next books <laughs> um the next question is about Dashiva, the Ashaman that um, Ran has chosen. So I mentioned that he was chosen by random. And my question is, is Dashiva trustworthy? Um, I think he is. Tame mentioned that he is not experienced and wasn't too happy that Ran has chosen him. My theory is that Ran specifically chosen someone who was greener and therefore someone who could be molded because someone that's in higher ranks of Ashaman would be too much in under the influence of Mazrim Tain. And having someone who can be influenced directly might prove beneficial in the future. And uh, my last question is question for readers new and old and since i am a new reader and i'm reading for wheel of time for the first time i'm just asking about all of your experience about the scene in the uh, throne room with uh, colavir it was weird it was written weird am i the only one i mean this specifically about ren's inability to deal with women it's something w we've seen i've seen before uh previous times his inability to deal with land fear with um just random um dark friends that he's encountered through the books but this felt weird the way it was written and everything it wasn't bad um i just was the intention that well, I'm maybe I'm just fixating on something that I'm just fixating. I just the way it was written was weird. I I can't help myself. So was it weird? Am I the only one? <laughs> uh, let's move on to what I liked. And uh, first of all, um, very minor, a very but very curious uh, world building tidbit: the mention of a clock. Um, a large city clock, uh, not like a, a small clock table on the table or something, but it's still a, presumably a mechanical clock nevertheless. And up until now, I thought wrongly, I suppose, that everyone just navigated time according to the sun position uh, during the day. But uh, why is that? I guess that's fully on me, because there's no reason why they wouldn't have clocks if they do have illuminators and their inventions. Um, not to mention, the setting is closer to early Renaissance, not Middle Ages, and even though clocks wouldn't be out of, out of place in the Middle Ages anyway. So, not only did the clocks survive or, well, that's my kind of, uh, it's not a question, it's just a, 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 an interesting tidbit. Either the clock survived the last turn of the wheel, or they keep reinventing them, because there is a real need for them. And that's something I like, because clocks are important things in a civilization. Um, another thing that I liked is... Mihail or Mihail or whatever you pronounce his name. So the self-appointed title that a Muslim Dane has given to himself behind, well, Rand's back. And I think that's very um, cunning and very appropriate because this is the exact level of ambition I expect from him uh, because he is displaying his ambition without being overly explicit. Now, Rand notices it, but uh, Tame is not a, as, as a subtle character as he thinks he is. Uh, we know he is power hungry, he know he is knowledge hungry, he know he is ambitious uh, above all else. So, well, after all, he is the former false uh, dragon. So, yeah. Another thing that I liked is a quote. 
When you leap from a cliff, Deera replied, it's too late for anything but holding to your courage and hoping there's hay at the bottom. Which is a very apt, apt quote for everything Rand does. <laughs> he often does things out of desperation and hope. But yeah, now uh, let's move on through things that I didn't like. Um, first point is neither, actually. I don't think it's neither positive or negative, but just an observation. This is a considerably shorter book than the previous two. And this is not a diss. Um, the last two books were some of the best. Uh, the last one was my favorite so far, and it's a ginormous book. But this one is like 700 plus pages, so you could fit a one entire novel <laughs> in between. But uh, like I said, it's not a negative. I mean, I am a person who prefers the extended edition of The Stand, which adds a lot, and I don't think it's it's bad. I, I think you can have a ginormous book and still have it be well edited and fit one single novel. Um, but what I didn't like were two things. One is something that I talked and talked and talked at length uh, before, and that's prologue. Um, purely on a mechanical level, on a, on, a, on a writing level, just I don't see the reason to have a prologue that doesn't feel like a prologue because there's no cryptic establishing um, moments between um, some new players in the story. No, it, it starts with Elida and every, everyone else. We all know who these people are. And it's super long. It's I think it's the longest chapter in the book. It's like 80 pages or something. And I don't think there's a single chapter in the book so far that's longer than like 30 pages and at that point I just don't see why you don't make it a normal chapter or just break it up because it doesn't feel like a prologue anymore and um, I don't know I mean I, to be fair it has been explained to me that it might be just something that publishers insisted since if you have um, if you have, and that was a fact for the longest time with Wheel of Time, that the time between publishing of books has increased during the years. So if you had a lengthy prologue, which you can give to your readers at the end of a reprint of a last book, or just give it as a something to to for the I don't know for a marketing to preserve readers I don't know uh, there is a a point to it I just writing wise I don't see why it is the way it is and uh, my last negative point is I mentioned the scene with Col uh, Colavir being weird it was weird I don't think it was bad but the chapter with Egwene and the commotion and Mogadian's escape was, in my opinion, if not bad, very loosely written. Uh, it was too scattered. Um, and Jordan's writing is usually much tighter when it comes to that. Uh, granted, yes, this is not battle, but I don't think that battles are the only uh, Jordan's talent. He is quite gifted at conveying the confusion of the unexpected, uh, be it an attack, a daring escape, uh, an incident that occurs in the night, in the night, uh, things of that nature. I just thought it was very loose. I think the mistake was spending too much time in Gwen's head at that point. If it was um, written a bit more in with the exterior in mind, 
or maybe some other character point of view it would have been better not terrible but uh, i have to point it out that i wasn't too happy with it now let's move on to predictions i only have two uh, one is i do believe that dashiva will stay loyal to rand uh, how and why i don't know he might sacrifice himself or something but i do think that dashiva is still to be trusted to an extent um, and my other prediction is Elida will become a dark friend puppet uh, through LVR most likely. And uh, I think it's something that I expected to happen sooner than later. Uh, but now that she is the Emerlin, she, um, and she has been an Emerlin for quite a while, um, her being poisoned by dark friends might prove catastrophic for everyone involved for the tower for rand for people just regular people and so forth so yeah that's it um thank you guys for watching and gals and everyone else um i hope everyone is safe and uh, do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video um, I am once again uh, very grateful for Ethan and his continued support on Patreon. Hi Ethan, uh, thank you and uh, see you next time. Uh, comment if you disagree with something or I said something that's just factually wrong. I am open to corrections. Bye bye. <music>